Hey, Mike, what do Kelly Slater and PT have in common? I don't know. They're both world champs? Nope. They both own Endless Summer Box Set. Oh, my God. Rad. You guys, you can get it, too. The link's in the show notes. Hey everybody, welcome to the QuiverCast, where we chat with surfers from all around the world, from all walks of life, and we get their story. Find us at www.thequivercast.com. I am Mike, your host. Let's get into the show. Hello, everybody. This is Mike here with the QuiverCast, and I am so stoked. I got a super special guest. Rochelle Ballard is here, and how are you doing? I'm doing great. Yeah, happy to be here. Happy to uh, have a conversation with you. I am stoked. Thank you. You're in Hawaii right now, right? Yeah, I'm on the island of Kauai, where I was raised. Yeah, on the south side. And are you stoked? I mean, you've been all over the world, and you still call Kauai your home. Do you oh, live yeah. there? I, you, you know, I, I have. I've been all, all over the world, and I just absolutely always love coming home. Um, whether I was, you know, living on Oahu, on the North Shore, or Kauai, it's like, Hawaii is just a special place, um, and lucky to call it home. You know, particularly Kauai, because it's that intimate relationship that I have here growing up, and also my family. Um, okay. My family, my family are all kind of surrounding me down the street, Um you know, across the valley and on the other side, east side, west side. So, yeah, super, super happy to be home. I moved from Oahu on the North Shore when in 2012, sold my place at Sunset and uh, moved back here and brought my um, surf and yoga um, retreat and surf lesson business with me back to Kauai and, you know, doing Rochelle Ballard surf experiences and, and private retreats for people. Tell us about what you do. It, it, it's all based on like yoga and then surfing. It's all of it. It's yoga, surfing, you know, bodywork, massage, wellness, this holistic approach to adventure wellness, really, and, and enjoying Kauai and um, learning from a professional, learning from myself um, and my team <laughs> <laughs> how to how to surf from the basics or people that like just want to improve their skills and advance and, and be better and be guided giving people holistic approaches and tips on whether it's like in the consumption of the type of foods that you're eating or the consumption of the thoughts that you're allowing in your mind and the things that come out of you, the way you breathe, the way you stand, the way you walk, your meditation, your movement. It's a whole experience. And then, you know, of course, Kauai does half the work for me because it's so beautiful here. Yeah. The adventure aspects of it and just soaking in nature. So, yeah. So let's start way back when you started surfing. Okay, sure. How, how old were you when you started surfing? Well, actually, the first time I probably grabbed a board and, you know, paddled out, I was in Waimea on the west side here with some of the boys. And we literally, like, jumped in this little dinghy boat and um, paddled up the river. And there was waves coming in just in the river mouth. And they threw a board at me. And it was I don't even remember what the board looked like, but it wasn't a soft top. It was like <laughs> probably like a fiberglass single fin board or something like that. Probably. Yeah. And I was probably like six or seven and they're like, let's go surfing. Like you just got to like, pat, you know, get on the board, paddle out, turn around, stand up, ride the wave. I'm like, okay. <laughs> that was the first time. And and I, I don't think I did much out there. I think I was probably like just walking around in the sandbar and just trying to catch waves. And then really like fast forward probably to like, I think eight, nine, and ten is when I was um got a soft top for Christmas and it was going out at Hanalei um out of the pier and and uh, Kealia on the sandbars and learning with my cousin and my dad and and this, you know some kids in the neighborhood and stuff. So it's a lot different back then. There wasn't like really like the surf lesson thing going on. Like maybe if you're like a visitor in Waikiki or you know Kalapaki yeah. with the yeah. Kinimakas or something like that. But generally, it wasn't for you know, locals or for any of that. It was like, we just figured it out. You went out with your friends, you went out with your family and, you know, you're paddling out and, you know, the, the ocean teaches you 
quickly. <laughs> because you're surrounded by ocean, is it like riding a bike in Hawaii? Like growing up, like everyone surfs? Yeah, I think that's part of it. It's like the lure of it all because, you know, like as a family, we were always down at the river mouth in Anahola. We were down at the beach, wherever we were, you know, all around the island. That's what you do. It's like everybody packs up the car, goes to the beach, goes the whole day. So you're like bo boogie boarding, usually body surfing, swimming. And then eventually you're like, okay, I want to like go out the back and yeah. catch waves. And then, you know, somebody in the family teaches you how to do it, basically. It's that's so cool. rad. Yeah. yeah, it's like you learn to swim, you play around, and then you like kind of get the courage to get past the shore break, really. Yeah, so you're just surround. It's like a water culture, basically, ocean culture. Hundred percent, like earth and water. It's all like Malka Makai, you know. Like we're 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 playing in the ocean, we're jumping off the rocks, we're like you know swimming, and then you want to go learn how to spear fish and dive and fish off the rocks, and then you're in the mountains hiking and like you know just kind of making trails and making forts and huts and yeah you know, stomp around in the mud and <laughs> it's just like the nature of living on Kauai is getting primal getting into the earth getting into the ocean let's say in your in your surfing pro surfing career and you're meeting all these other people other surfers mm -hmm. from around the world did they grow up in similar circumstances as you as you got to know them or were they like totally different um some of it I think that like back in that day you know like when I um, got on the tour, it was 90, 1990. Yeah. yeah. And so there wasn't cell phones and, and co the computer thing wasn't like the social aspect and, and commonality. So everything was really still pretty simple. And I remember, I remember even getting like the, the contest schedule and yeah. it was in the mail and it was just wow. a newsletter with like a schedule on it, just like the NSSA. Yes. yes. You know, like all the amateur events. That's how it was. And like, unless somebody like told you how to do it or where to go, like you had no <laughs> idea. Like it wasn't. And then like results from like amateur and professional ASP events would show up in like the following month's magazine results. Yes. Like that, you know, yeah. so turtle snail trail, yeah. you know, that's how it was. Like I went over to my mom's house the other day and she's like, guess what I found? I'm like, what? She's like, I didn't know if you had this issue or not. And I figured there was a reason why I was keeping it. But she still had the surfing magazine wrapped in the plastic. And I was like, oh. And I opened it up. And I was like flicking through the magazine. I was like, yes, I love this. It's so fun. It's so fun to like physically grab a magazine and flip through it. And you get to see like, you know, all the like who's there, what's happening. And it's it's just there's this joy to it that I love. It's like picking up a book and reading it instead of like looking at your phone or a computer or like a, you know, whatever it is. And, and, and like yeah. I flipped through it and it was like Andy and like Bruce and Sonny and like, you know, just, I, it was like our boat trip and in Indo and like the surfer magazine thing. It was just sort of really cool. You know, it was fun. So I think that that's the thing. It was, it was a lot different back then. And so the people like that I was competing against, you know, long story short, getting back to the question. Yes. It's really like some of them were like that. It depends on where they grew up. I think if they grew yes. up in Huntington, you know, Newport, no. Completely different environment. Right. Yeah. You're, you're Cement City. But like if, if you're growing up in Australia and you're like Byron Bay or the Goldie mm. or like WA, they're definitely just like us. You know, like you're just like the Grom on the beach and, and like just, you know, hitchhiking back home and playing in the mountains and in the jungle and just whatever was – fun was outdoors it wasn't in the house kind of the the general rule with most of us was like you just had to be home at dark you know yeah. yeah otherwise you're just like you're hearing your name being yelled through the neighborhood or like you know you're in trouble like just be home by the time the sun goes down <laughs> that's rad yeah, yeah I, that's how it was it really was but yeah, you're like get on your bike get your skateboard hitchhike whatever it was just grab your board get your skateboard go down to the beach and you're just like there all day <laughs> yeah so in your environment did you feel was it safe there in Kauai like just to yeah. cruise and go super safe super safe yeah that's right. it was great and there wasn't any like migrating people from all over the place you know working remote and all you know I mean it's just such a different place and world nowadays yeah even on Kauai it's it's different it's like there's a lot more people moving here there's less control of the environment there's 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 homeless 
which is wild to me because we never had homeless. And if they were, you knew who they were. You're like, oh, you know, they just kind of, unfortunately, like either had a drug problem or like, you know, some family stuff or like they just schizophrenia or something like that. But you knew them. And they were like still nice people. They weren't harming. They weren't harmful or like going to do anything. Like it's just kind of now it's like there's people there's like different states are like one way tickets sending homeless to Kauai. That's crazy. And we're like, what's happening right now? Where are they coming from? So these aren't local people. No, it's oh, well, it's crazy. there are that now after COVID, yeah. you okay. know, because of all the astronomical, you know, I mean, where do you, where do you start with it? You know, with uh-huh. between real estate and, you know, the way that, that uh, the government like, you know, handed out money and then, you know, the price of living and, it's just all too much, you know? Yeah. We'll get back on surf because that's, yeah. that's, 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 that's one more fun. <laughs> yeah. So as you progress, do you have a group of friends that you guys are all surfing together and pushing each other? How do you progress in surfing? For sure. Like that was the thing. Like when I was a kid growing up and like my parents got a divorce and then they moved to the South side here in Kaloa and the kids that I met, cause my parents My mom and my stepfather owned the Beach House restaurant back in the day, right there. One of the ladies, um, Linda Graham, that was working there, her two sons, Cody Graham, um, his brother, they were surfers. They lived right up the street from me. And so I would catch a ride with them down at the beach all the time. And they're the ones that were like, let's go surfing. And what are you riding right now? You need a shorter board. Like, what what is that? I'm like, I don't know. (laughs) I'm out there surfing. I don't care. Yeah. So they like kind of like helped me to hone in like the skills and the the boards that I was riding. They're like, we're going to a contest this weekend. You want to come to the contest with us? I'm like, sure. You know, and I remember entering my first contest. There was just three of us women and I got third because I had no idea what I was doing. And there were older women in it. You know, I was like the Grom and they were like in their 20s. So they just did circles around me, just getting the best waves and everything. But that, you know, that's what it was. And then fast forward, carrying from there, then it's, I was really surfing a lot with the boys, whether it was North Shore or Southside, Braden Diaz, Chaba and Kai Greenlee, like, and uh, Borg and I don't know, just a bunch of them. All the North Shore guys, the whole pipeline posse. Yeah. And then it was like, all of a sudden we're like getting on tour with it all. And then uh, there's Andy and Bruce and the Kiala. And and then, you know, Megan and I became really good friends. And Lisa, you know, Anderson and I had the same coach when we were like in high school. Wow. Um, you know, somehow this guy in, in San Diego and like he got us together for a heat and ocean side. And, you know, so it's like it is. It's that inspiration of like your peers growing up where you're you live and then all of a sudden you find that group when you're on the tour you know of who you get along with and who you feel like this friendly competition right where you can inspire from each other instead of like you're just you know you don't even want to look at that person in the heat now you want to <laughs> <laughs> you know and it's like it's this it's it's almost like a in a in a weird way like you know in college it's like you have your frat you have your clubs you have all these different things that's what it's like it's you're in this advancing place and, and you're traveling together, but your family, because that's your family. You, you begin to realize because you're, you're on tour more than you are at home. And yeah. so you have this whole other lifestyle that's way different than when you're at home with the, you know, the kids that you grew up with and your family. And so it's like, how do you, know, you, you, you figure it out. And then, you know, you have your travel buddies that you all of a sudden you're in the same heats with, or oftentimes we'd be in the finals together. You know, we always like, God, whoever you're staying with, you're going to, if you're doing well, they're either like, you're coming up against them in early rounds or you're in the finals together. And so you, you end up like learning how to be in a, in a more inspirational, positive place with it and feeding off of each other rather than this animosity or, or weird vibe. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So of course you probably have heard of Lisa Anderson. You guys are getting coached by the same coach and you're doing mock heats in Oceanside, right? Yeah. Is that the first time you met her? Yeah, it was. And I was already like from looking at the magazines, you know, yeah. it was like, oh, Lisa Anderson, she's like the shit, you know, it yeah. was like Kelly and Lisa, everybody was like, you know, frothing out on them. And so I was like, oh, this is cool. It was intimidating, but I was stoked too. So how did that go? How did that, those heats go? Those mock Good, heats? good. We were like, you know, up and up with each other and having fun with it, but like still kind of like shy a little bit about it. And then like all of a sudden we had, I mean, I know we weren't supposed to because we were too young, but we had a beer. And we were like, oh, what's that? Like, talking story and like kind of broke the ice and having fun yeah, together. Cool. And then, 
you know, and then late, later on down the line, like we became good friends and started traveling together and then we'd be in heats together. And, you know, funny enough, I had a better odd against her because I was so inspired by her that like, I just, I loved surfing with her and she was, she's such a, she's such a humble champion that we'd laugh and have fun. She wasn't trying to mentally distract me like mm-hmm. Lane would and, and get <laughs> under my skin, let's say. And so I had worse odds against Lane because it would piss me off that she kept winning and that she would get under my skin. And I wasn't myself competing against her. You know, I surf better when I was surfing against Lisa than when I was surfing against Lane. So it's funny funny thing like that do you think lane knew that she oh yeah she was super like heady (laughs) and a great competitor so you know i think that all that stuff if if you look at the parallel you know or the comparison of today's competitors compared to our generation there's there's so much more coaching and heat strategy and you know pre-game like where you're training a lot more and you're way more prepared in all the different things that happen. And for us, we were just like surfing and we're Mm. trying to figure out how to compete. And, you know, we're also dealing with so many different other adversities of like proving ourselves as women in being in a, a valued, a viable sport. And that was the, I was, all of it was like adversity in a way, like, and, and the women were just like, You know, we were just like dog eat dog. It was like everything was just like the lobster out of the like pot, you know, just trying to Mm. like struggle for that success. And there was only few that were making it and had sponsorships or that were, you know, uh, understood all that instead of being in this positive, like, like kind of building with each other. It was it was a little different. And it and it took. You know, that transition of what the the generation before us, that they had to go through a lot of adversity, like way more than us, actually, with Pam Burridge and Jody Cooper and Wendy and Free Zamba and all those women. And then even back further with Margo and Rel and and um, Jericho and all those ladies, like they they went through so much, you know, because their generation was like they just wanted them to be like doing what T-shirt contests and like you know, whatever it took to get the attention of like, you know, mainstream and, and then they're like, well, or you should just be back in the kitchen, you know? So like there was so much that women had to go through to get to this stage of where it's at, that it's just like, it's that high time that it's here. And it's like, finally, it took so much work. And, and now they can be in that pure positivity and pure stoke and professionalism because they have the support because they have a stage that's that's prepared for them to enter it in in this golden era really it's like super golden era of women surfing right now and and it you know it's it's not that it's it's ever easy i think that they they still have to deal with a lot of the pressure of stepping up to that plate because everybody expects them to be really good and they expect them to pull into like deep pits at pipe and tropo and like being able to like match the men really because of the equality factors that are coming into it. So, you know, there's definitely a different type of pressure that's there. Let's say. Now I'm going to ask you one question and maybe I'm, I don't know, but there's always pressure if you're a professional, anything, right? So professional surfing, no matter what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Baseball, volleyball, whatever it is. Well, since you're talking about this now, are you stoked that the women get to surf pipeline now? Just like the yeah. guys, yeah, it's awesome. It's super awesome. I mean, I still, I still have my moments where I'm just like, I am biting my nails for them because I'm worried that somebody's going to get hurt or something crazy is going to happen because it's such a crazy wave, you know. But that's like the way that women think. That's why it's taken so long to get to this place. That we're all just like, every time you go out there, you're just like, oh my god, I just want to like, I just got to settle these nerves because the forefront of your mind is turning around and like throwing yourself over this crazy ledge with like shallow reef. The consequences are what is the overcome for women in, in this, this part of surfing, you know, like it's, yeah, 
a, it's a different pressure when you're going on to a heat and you put your jersey on and you're surfing fun, rippable waves. It's just like your pure performance. But when it comes to, to the to the degree of difficulty and the, True the challenge of this velocity of big waves and pipeline and topo, it's all about that. And then and then yes, of course, the performance is like a huge part of it. But it's the fear factor that is the place that um, we need to um, to find that um, that adversity to rise above and and to find you know some calm power and to work with yeah. And really, there's not enough time in the water. There's not enough time um, in in reps that you're getting because the freaking men take over. And there's not enough opportunity to catch waves because you're dealing with liquid football. You're out in the freaking field with like a bunch of dudes that are way more aggressive and and powerful in paddling to get those waves. And so you're just like, God, I'm just trying to get, you're just inching your way into this lineup with like a hundred guys out there. There's like a wolf pack, literally yeah. on the waves. So to be fair, and I mean, the guys are struggling for waves too. It's not like yeah, everybody gets, totally. Everybody's struggling for waves out everybody there. Everybody is. It's a hell of a lot easier for a guy to get that aggressiveness and power yeah, the aggressiveness. into the wave and bully your way through it. It's like if you're like sitting there, like you know, like there's that like <laughs> there's that game in school where it's like you know where you do that, like everybody lines up and then you have to push and you you do this whole mm-hmm. like back and forth. Like you're not gonna like have like that like up against a guy. Right. Being able to push a guy out of that position, yeah. Like, yeah. for the most part, guys are clearly going to be able to do that. I think that it's definitely helpful that within equality and when, within social media and all this stuff, you can't like you can only get away with so much. Let's say because it gets seen too easily, and so and I think that also there's a lot more men that respect that place of a woman in the lineup and want to see them catch a wave and succeed and there is a lot more of like yeah go you know carissa or go yeah. stop or you know yeah. Mona or whatever whoever it is go rochelle <laughs> but it was like back in my day it, it wasn't that like they'd say it go rochelle, and it wasn't even that great of a wave you know like but when it was one of the really good ones they're like i'm going yeah. you know because they didn't want me to get a better wave than them wow you know? okay because it's an ego thing Okay. And it's, you know, like I, I listen to the, to women, women that are there now, you know, and they're, they're still fighting that same battle. They're still out there and the guy was still aggressive wanting the better way because it's just, there's no like, okay, it's your turn. It's, there's no fair game out there because everybody's still trying to get that shot and up their Instagram and their viewers. And they're like, what wave did you get? And like, I'm practicing for the contest and like, yeah, you know, there's all this on this on stake, and then it's like now you're, it's not just like the mature crowd that's out there on the CT or the the local pack. It's Groms. There's like freaking twelve year olds out there trying to hustle for an eight footer. It's nuts. Let's keep on the women for a second. What do you think of the up and coming women like Katie Simmers and some of these other? Are you following pro surfing today? Yeah, and yeah, her? she's amazing. I, yeah. I remember seeing her for the first time um, last year. I was coaching Brana uh, Cope out at uh, Snapper, and um, I was like, "Whoa, this chick is <laughs> really good!" And I remember Garth telling me, "He's like, hey, I got this girl that's on the team. She kind of reminds me a little bit of you, you know? Like, she says, go get her. She charges. She's like she rips and like she's small and mighty and everything." And and then I saw her surfing. I'm like, okay. She like really, it's kind of a trip because she has that like kind of classic like San Clemente, like bash and like Wardo and like kind of like that. Kinda, yeah. You know, in the sense that she's really like casual and just kind of, hey, what's up? <laughs> 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 it's happening. Yeah, whatever. I guess I had to catch that last wave and <laughs> I'm stoked. I'm stoked I'm in the next heat. You know, it's cool being on tour. Yeah. <laughs> kinda, she's got that really relaxed vibe. So I think it's just like that demeanor that's coming on in her, which is really, I love that approach because she's not trying so hard to be anybody but herself mm-hmm. and to be anybody but that local girl that is just stoked. And then she's just got this real pure, raw talent that she gets to express in in her surfing 
And what I love about these kids is that like the ones that can really be in their intuitive and really be themselves and not feel this instantaneous uh, buildup or pressure or like they have to, they're the ones that are really doing well right off the bat. And there's a different uh, mentality with it. There's a different patterning behavior that happens because there's no, there's not really yet a sabotage button in them Mm. yet. Mm. You know what I mean? Like they're just stoked. And and if they lose, they're like, Oh, that sucked. But like, what a, so what I got to do to get better they're not like, oh God, I'm I'm sucking. I'm I'm this. They're just like that sucked. What are you saying? Are you saying they they don't beat themselves up? They're just kind of they're like, not beating themselves up, but they're not beating themselves up as much okay. as they are observing the situation. Mm. They're not taking it as personal, I think. Mm. And if they are, it's only to become better. They're not. I don't. I don't feel anyway from the observation of it that. Um, they're letting it affect the personal, you know, well be well being, okay, or good. entering into this this pattern of sabotage, or like they have to prove themselves more. They're just like, okay, that was not the right move. That was clearly I need to do this next time. But like, you know, the ways were this, and my board is this, or I did that, and I could do this better. It's an it's more of a a, a straightforward. I feel like non emotional. They're just like seeing it as coaching and strategic and like learning curves, which is okay. amazing. I wish yeah. that I could have done that. Like I, I took it too, all too personal Did and you? joke and all that stuff. And I was too dramatic about it all instead of like separating the two things because I didn't have anybody to bounce it off of, you know, like there wasn't, I didn't have that team of coaching and the, you know, everything else. It's like I had, you know, Bill Ballard, my husband at the time, my ex-husband now, but like, He'd veto me and we'd like try and figure it out. But like, he wasn't a coach. I was learning how to compete better. I wasn't like really the best competitor. I just wanted to go free surfing. I'm like, how could I just, I like this competing thing, but I'd rather make videos and go free surf and travel the world and find like be on the search, you know? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then, and then also learning how to recover from injuries because from my my trailblazing aspects of outside of competition. I was like throwing myself over the ledge all the time. And then all of a sudden I'd be like, God, that hurt. Now I'm like, I have to go <laughs> compete. And my body's like struggling a little bit. Yeah. You know? And so you're learning how to recover and how to strengthen and how to find balance of like traveling the globe, living out, out of your, you know, suitcase and sleeping in different beds and long travel, you know, sitting and then dragging bags. Cause they didn't make the equipment as good back then. You were on the tour for so long, and you, yet you say you would have rather free surf. Like, you were on tour for a long time, right? Well, I really wanted a one world title. I mean, that's uh, I, really, I really had that, like, deep competitive drive in me. I just didn't know how to compete very well. <laughs> <laughs> well, you did good. <laughs> like this irony of it, right? I was always the dark horse. <laughs> They're like, she can do it. Come on, let's go. <laughs> so I would just, like, crumble. Every time I came to Hawaii, it was just like I felt this – instead of feeling – the opposite of the support, I felt pressure. Like I had to perform and I, or I was going to let everybody down. Mm. And so there's this mental switch and it's such a, you know, I, 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 in that moment. And even now I look back and I'm just like, geez, what a shame. All I needed was like a good coach to like flip that switch and feel that support and say, Hey, you know what? This is how you can look at it differently instead of, Stop looking at it like this. Actually, you do have all that support. Everybody just wants to see you succeed. If you don't win, they're still going to love you. You know, and yeah. it's like, it's this weird thing that when you're growing up, and I, I think where I derive from as a, probably from the ages of like seven on, like through high school, the opposite racism of America, where it's like usually the the white people are the assholes and like, you know, picking on dark people was the opposite. I was being picked on. Because I was white. Mm -hmm. And so I think that like a lot of this certain behavior came from that. Like I was afraid to raise my hand in class and get the answer wrong or to come up and speak or to read out loud or to do anything because I was holly trash crap, get in the back of the bus, get kicked out of my seat. I was scared in high school. I was scared. Well, more so in junior high and in um, elementary school, I was scared. 
And then, you know, what made me uh, have more confidence in like sophomore, I think on was that all of a sudden I got, you know, selected to go to the world amateur titles. And I left on a trip to go to Puerto Rico and, and then to Japan. Everybody's like, wow, that's so cool. You're the cool chick now. You're the surfer oh. girl. And I was like, all right, I'm getting somewhere. I feel better in school now. Like I, I feel like a little more confidence, but I was still scared in certain moments of like getting beat up. <laughs> by wow. some, of the, some of the chicks and in, in you know doing the wrong thing or whatever but i still have my local friends too so it's kind of it was confusing you know okay. and then also entering the lineup with the boys it was this proving grounds where if i if i didn't match up to their expectation then they'd cut me off on waves or you know whatever and i was just like oh, it was always having to prove myself and it was like this adversity inside you know, meanwhile, on the back end of the burner, they actually like had crushes on me. And I was just like, yeah, God, it's also confusing. <laughs> so nothing was really cut straight, black and white. It was all really great. It was tough as a teenager to maneuver through it. And then getting on the tour, all of a sudden, you know, there was the whole gay aspect and like, oh, you're a, a female surfer. You, you must be a dyke. And you're like, what? What the fuck is all this stuff? <laughs> You know, wow. and it was just like everything was con was really difficult in my generation because nothing that we did was acceptable. It was like everything was like, you know, I remember like going to Huntington Beach and I was practicing for the OP Pro or US Open. I don't even know what it was back then. Yeah, yeah. But um, this guy on the north side of the pier like cut me off blatantly. And I'm like growing, growing up with the boys. I'd be like, hey, brah, what are you doing? Yeah. You know, that's not cool. And I felt confident in the water because of growing up with all the boys. And he was like, who, who are you? Like, you must be some dyke on the tour. Like, this is my home. Wow. This is my beach. And I was like, wow. That's crazy. It was crazy. And, and so it just, it kept being this, like, you feel good. And then it, you'd get put down. And then I'd get on tour and I'd go somewhere. And then I remember going to a, the first ASP meeting in like, one of the guys from Australia was like, oh, you know, raising their hand going, we don't want to be on the tour with the women. Can we have our own separate tour? Like, it's just not, we're not in the same playing field. And like, and you're like, wow, what is this? You know? And so, you know, like they, we weren't good enough for them. They're like, well, they don't surf that good. And so everything was a proving ground, every single thing that we did. And that's why like when my, um, when Bill and I made, Blue Crush, that was our first avenue of saying, hey, you know what? Fuck all this stuff. This is crazy. <laughs> Let's do what Momentum did. Let's do what Taylor Steele did. Let's build our momentum with women surfing. And so we got the, the girls that we felt were like a great representation of women surfing in performance and like their joy and that like, you know, contagious attitude and charisma in surfing and say, let's, let's make a surf movie. Let's go surf around the world. We're going to go to all the places that we're already surfing on the tour, like step aside and film. And then, you know, go to some special spots and film and then make a surf movie. And it was the first high performance female surf movie that captured an audience and got the attention of not just like us proving to the men, but all of a sudden right around the same time, it was like Roxy, in Billabong and O'Neill and everything was happening in the surf industry with women's apparel. And so all of a sudden there was women wanting to surf and they were the ones that were creating the lifestyle and this whole new generation of female surfers that was never really there since maybe like Ralph Sun's generation mm. where, and then before that, right. Cause it kind of like in the eighties, I feel like it kind of tapered and it got like kind of funky because it was being suppressed by mm. male pro surfing and the industry and how it all went because there was nothing there for women. And so a lot of, that's why I say a lot of those women, like that were professionals, they were surfing great. They, they just had to deal with too much. And so there, it, you know, there wasn't enough there for them. It wasn't their fault. Had they been supported more, you know? And so, yeah, I think that then, you know, kind of, we kept making different videos and then all of a sudden, like, you know, like as, the surf industry grew and as we were like, just like being the cheerleaders and the surfers for it all, then all of a sudden universal pictures came into it 
and they wanted to make, you know, the project on women serving and, yeah. uh, you know, they couldn't think of a better name. And so they bought the name blue crush from Bill and I, and then they, they're like, well, we need a girl to serve pipeline. So, and we, you know, I was like the match for, um, Kate Bosworth. And so I did the stunt work, uh, for her. And then they're like, well, we need somebody to be her, you know, uh, her competitor. And so it was Kayla Kenley. <laughs> yeah. So here we are, you know, and, and then yeah. it was like, well, we need a couple others. And it was like, Megan Abubo was my, like the, you know, played the role of Michelle Rodriguez. And then it was just like classic because Megan and I were besties and Kayla and I were the ones that the only ones at the time, for the most part, that were actually like pulling in at, at backdoor and pipe. And we go up together in a chopo and like pushing it. And like, all of a sudden, like, just started like we didn't even have jet skis we weren't even towing blue crush got us all into it and then brian kialana and kai borg and terry hui and those guys are the ones that taught megan and i how to tow surf and we caught wow. like a 20 foot wave together you know and it was just like everything was happening and we were like okay like i only go back door like i don't want to go to pipe because every time i go there i like i get thrown over the ledge and i can't make the drop and i hit my head and it's just crazy you know so I learned how to surf pipe filming for Blue Crush. Did you have much experience before that or none? Just back door? I did a little, not not much. I did a little, yeah. but it was just too feisty trying mm -hmm. to go left. And I was too scared backside. It was just really difficult. And nobody was supporting me and nobody wanted me to get one of those waves. So I was just like, well, I'm just going to go back door because it's easier. It's front hand. Yeah. You know, but even it wasn't easy. <laughs> oh but, no it's a, it's a heavy wave you know, yeah it was still a heavy wave i would have surfed a lot more had i had more women to surf with but it's just like lisa would go out there with me every now and then megan like serena like some of the crew but like ultimately they were over it they didn't want to surf it because it was just hard to get waves you're like just they're like, well, we want to go surf we're sitting out there with all these guys and we're not catching much waves and it's scary and it's we're breaking boards and we're over it so then it would be like Kial and i again we're like okay well let's go you know and then it's just like you had to make that choice because of the tour. You could only surf it so much because then I would take myself out for the Triple yeah. Crown, you know, or for yeah. the next season that would start yeah. in February. It was like we didn't have that much of a window. It was like everything was just like up against the wall of our, our tour season. We had six weeks off. That's crazy, too. Yeah. It was. And then we had, you know, both tours going at the same time. There was tons of events and it was a lot. Um, it was. It sounds like a lot. It was. was it, there was a lot. You guys were surfing a lot. You were trying to get around the world and, and just everything going on. But was it fun? It was so fun. It was so fun. I mean, that's why, like, <laughs> any athletic career has a peak at kind of a younger age because you just, like, run it hard. You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> you really do. You're traveling the world. You know, you're you're living in a peak performance in your in your mind, in your body in your abilities, in all aspects of life, your emotions, how much you are having to push aside family and all the other things in life, because it has to be number one, what you're doing. Otherwise, you're not going to make it. You're not going to be successful. Wow. And are you glad you did it? I mean, or do you have yeah. regrets? Oh, no. 100%. I would do yeah. it all over again. I would just make sure I had a coach. Okay. <laughs> So do you think the kids are overcoached today or do you think it's great that they have so much coaching and they're, uh, they're kind of, I, I think there could be an aspect of a little bit of overcoaching. I think that it can be, it can get to a place where it's like, you know, personally to me, I think that the coaches are probably more becoming dependent upon it as a job and want course. to make sure that they're super providing for their client. And then, you know, I mean, it's, it's my generation guys that are doing it and, but it, and all at the same time, they're passionate about it. They want to do of it course. to the best of their ability. They want to do the best job possible. So you can't blame it all. Right. And it's like, it's a tough in the, in the back end of it. It's like, it's like an actor or a musician. It all looks like super fun and like this amazing lifestyle, but on the back yeah. side of it all, it's, it's a burnout. It's, you run it hard. Yeah. And it's a it's a lot to do because there is so much to do. You're not just going surfing. You know? Do you think the athletes of today had as much fun as you guys did back then? I think do they think? do. Like do I you think, think that so? I think that um some of them do, some of them don't. And and really ultimately that's their responsibility and their their choices. 
if they're going to take it too seriously, if they're going to like have like a nice, you know, like Steph Gilmore, she has a blast. <laughs> you know, she's stoked. She's having so much fun with everything that she does. And then she takes it seriously. She's, you know, she's all of that. It's like, she's a gnarly competitor. She wants it, you know, just as much more than anybody, but she knows when to let go and to have fun. Mm-hmm. I I think, I mean, I'm, I'm not speaking for her. I'm speaking from yeah. my opinion of it and, yeah. and knowing her enough, you know, but I, I, I look at like, you know, say somebody like, um, you know, Carissa and it's like, she's got a lot of responsibility now that she's the gold medalist and, and yeah. You know, I think that that took that that probably for her took it to a whole nother level of responsibility as an athlete. And then because she's such an amazing Aloha spirit, and one of the things that I absolutely adore about her is that she she took the torch. Like, you know, Rel Sun was doing this in her generation, and I did it in my generation, and now she's doing it in her generation of of giving back to the keiki, giving back to the youth taking care of them, uh, mentoring them, giving them the tools, sharing with them, encouraging them and inspiring them. And it's huge. And that yeah, takes rough. a lot of work and time and effort to do that and, and, and to take the responsibility of, you know, what your sport's doing and, and um, you know, being in the media with all that and, and then still having family and like, you know, she's got the husband and everything else that's happening. So it's like, it's a, it's a lot, but it's, it's also beautiful. Yeah. Did you feel responsible? Did you feel you had surfing yeah. on your shoulder? Women oh, surfing yeah. on your shoulder? I felt Did responsible you? for sure. Because if I look back at what I went through and what I expressed to you already, like yes. I wish that I had somebody doing that for me. Like I did. I mean, listen, not like Nelson Togioka. That was like my, my cousin, Tony Sarabia, my dad, my mom. Like I had people that were there that were helping me through it all. But to have somebody that's actually on the tour, you know, and Margo mm-hmm. Oberg was helpful, but like, she didn't want to give me her secrets. Really? You know? No. And it's a different generation. Yeah. And I think there was a bit of that where it was like, they wanted to hold the record. They wow. wanted to do this. And it's like, you know, there's a difference between like sharing that aloha and mentoring in that way, or just like, you know, let, let's see, if, you know, I want to help you out, you know, you should that's give a little bit, little tidbits, you know, like, I mean, even like in my generation, like we, the type of body work that I do now, this energy work and like, you know, chino san, like deep belly work and like unwinding tissue, like Shane Beshin and I do that. But when we were learning from Kent Ewing, this type of work and like a few of us were getting the work from him, we didn't want to tell anybody about it because that was our kind of like secret sauce of unwinding the tissue and like feeling freer. And it was also mental coaching and energetics to give you the upper hand. I didn't start getting that work until I think I was like 32. And all of a sudden I was like, wow, game changer. My body feels so much better because I was ready to retire, you know, because my body was just shot from like doing crazy stuff in surfing. You know, that's why I do what I do too with the yoga and like everything else. And I was a massage therapist since I was like 21. So, you know, there's a, a lot of athletes from our experiences when we go into retirement or you go to the next, I don't even, I think it's graduating. It's not retiring unless you're making like a shit ton of money. You're not retiring. Right. You're, yeah. you're what's, what are you doing next with your life? You're right. right? Next step. Yeah. yeah. So it's, you know, it's what are your, what's your next platform that you're going to work from? So you take what you've learned and you bring that with you. If you're smart to, okay. you know, use that as a, as a foundation you know, for me and for, I think a lot of athletes, especially nowadays are using those tools and wellness, you know, training and then meditation or like, you know, all the, all the different aspects that, that can go to another athlete type or into even just commonality of like people that work nine to five jobs. How do you overcome mental stress? Yeah. How do you overcome, you know, fatigue and brain fog and disease and lack of energy or whatever it is. It's like athletes have work. We have the key to these things. We know how to unlock those doors because that's all we do when we're striving for our best is, you know, how do we become our best in our body and mm-hmm. our mind and in our energetic spirit? How did you get into yoga? Like, do you remember how it came? Yeah, into your I life? do. I do. I was 18 and I injured myself surfing and 
my next door neighbor was a yoga teacher and a massage therapist. And so I went to go see her for a shiatsu and she taught me where my breath came from and how to breathe and then how it affected my mental awareness and then, mm-hmm. you know, how to move and then like working on my body. And I was like, wow, this is fascinating. Yeah. I want to, I want to learn more about this. And and at the time, even though I wanted to be a professional surfer and, you know, win a world title and all that, it wasn't actually a career option. I was still like doing doubles at, you know, my parents' restaurant at Brennan Beach Parlor. And so I became a massage therapist. And then I was like, well, I could take this as the first step, still see if I go to college and then do the tour. <laughs> I was like yeah, already yeah. multitasking stuff, you know? You're right. You know, one thing led to another. And then I, you know, I was doing the tour and I was massaging the guys on the tour. Mm. And I was just doing yoga for myself. I went to a couple of classes, but there wasn't really many class options at that time in the, in the early nineties. And so okay. I had like the DVDs and I was just kind doing of self-taught. It. Yeah. Yeah. Learning from DVDs. And then I was like, all right, throw the yoga mat in the board bag. Cause it pads the board bag and no matter where you go, you can use that mat to stretch and work out. Yeah. And so that's what I did. And that was always my go-to. And then like, eventually I'd throw in like the, you know, big yoga ball and I'd throw in like some resistant bands you know, and then I was like, all right, I'm going to throw in some golf clubs in my board bag. <laughs> right. So it's like, you start to explore all these different avenues um, as you're on the tour for so long and all the different things and phases and stages that we've gone through. Yeah. So. <laughs> Do you think it, it gave you that longevity of being on the tour for so long? Yeah, for you know? sure. Yeah. Sure. Okay. You, you can't just focus on sur- your competing and, and, and not surfing. just surfing. No, that's why I feel like a lot of, or not a lot of, but a few of the surfers like play the guitar or they learn how to edit, you know, mm-hmm. or they want to get into fashion and build like their own signature line, you know, different things like that. Because it's like you, if you don't stimulate your mind in other mm-hmm. avenues, it's just you get bored or you're, it's mundane and, or, you know, you're, yeah, you, you're not stimulated enough or you're, you're, you're yeah. too serious. And then you lose sight of, of what you're, you know, the purpose of what you're doing. Okay. You know, your your and, sport for. Because yeah. ultimately you start, you're doing it because you want to have fun and express yourself. And of course you have these like deep goals of like tenacity to, to win and to achieve the, the highest utmost. Right. Today, who can go see you? And I, I think you do it online too, right? Mm-hmm. Some of your classes. How, how do you, oh, yeah. and I'll post it on the show notes. Thank you. This, but. Yeah, you just you go to surfintoyoga.com. Uh, on there, you you can see that you would book a, a private surf retreat with me. Um, you could just come and, you know, do like a, a simple day experience and go surfing with me and get a massage and do yoga, whatever you want. Sounds do. fun. It's all there. <laughs> and then I also have an online Surf My Body Wellness course that I just started this past year. It's a Rochelle Ballard Flow or just RochelleBallard.com. Yeah. Okay. And so people can do like the online side of it if they can't afford to, you know, come to Kauai and work with me. So right, right on, and all on Kauai, right? That's where you yep. stay. Yep, everything's on Kauai. Um, How much are you surfing? I'm still surfing a bunch. Like you know, I still go surfing with my, um, you know, posse of girls. Like I'm always surfing with Brianna Cope and oh, a couple of the the other girls here and Bethany and you know, a few of us and then, you know, always the boys and stuff. So, I mean, quite so small. It's like, we're always like, Hey, where's the surf? What are we doing? Like, where are we going? Run South, West, North, you know, East side, whatever. Kaipo, hockey, S and I that like grew up, you know, going to high school and then traveling the world together. He and I still go surf together. And he's actually one of my, you know, my right hand guys and, and doing yeah. surf coaching and surf lessons and stuff. So, you know, it's, it's cool. We're, we're all really tight. And, uh, I was going to go surfing today and, you know, I was just like, I can't do it. I got to, I got too much to focus on, but I surf yesterday and I surf as much as I can, you know, it just yeah. depends on how much time in the day I have and what the ways are doing and if it's worth it. Did you have, you talked about your group of friends while you were on tour. Did you mm-hmm. have any hardcore rivals besides, I guess that lane you kind of said, where you wanted to be this person? Yeah, so I think bad. Lane was probably the biggest rival. Lisa, um, Megan, Keala, Serena, Brooke. 
uh, Sophia, Chelsea. Mm. I mean, God, you just keep going through the generations. Mel, Mel Bartels. Yeah, because you were there so long. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the last person I competed against for my final heat, ironically enough, was like Steph Gilmore. Wow. And it was such a trip because like it was her first, I think it was her first or second year on tour. She were at Honolulu and I had priority and she was like sitting just on the inside of me and this like sneaky wave came in and they, she got this sick, sick barrel and got spat out and got a 10 and uh, I was like, there it is. Oh, that's the end. That's the next generation that's coming sick. up though. That's right. It, but it was cool. You know, yeah, like I mean, so in cool. that moment, it's like really emotional and I was already planning on retiring. So I think okay. that when you like already have it in mind that you're just like, all right, it's like, you kind of, your ratings drops off and you're kind of like, you're just not, your heart's not in it, you know? Yeah. So you're kind of like already looking to the next thing. And, uh, and so, yeah, that's where all that was, <laughs> but it was, you know, I mean, I, you know, so many of these women that like, that were through the generations of it that, um, I really, they helped to inspire me to stay there because they're so good. And I just love, even today, like, I still want to, like, be up there doing the best you miss it. I can in the, in the surf, you yeah. know, like surf free surfing. I just, I always want to, like, be on my game and surf as be the best I can. And I'm always building my quiver and working with my shaper and, you know, like, want to go video and, like, do all this stuff. And so it's fun. You know, that's, that's awesome. It, when you, when you love surfing, that's it. Thank you so, so much, Michelle. I really appreciate it. It was super fun. And I learned a lot today, actually. So I'm stoked. All right, everybody. This is Mike and Michelle Ballard, and we are out of here. Thank you. Thank you so much.
Hey, you guys, Endless Summer box set. This thing is legit. It's authentic, numbered certificate in it. It has a five-frame film strip. From the original print, you will literally own a piece of history. It has a specially minted bronze medallion. Dude, that thing's sick. Okay, there's so much more here. Go to the show notes. There's a link on there. Go check this piece of history out. This thing's rad. Seriously. Smithsonian American History Museum has it. It took four years of research with 3.5 in production. All hand assembled. This thing's rad. So much to this awesome box set. Remastered DVD. Sharper images than the original film. But dude, this thing's so sick. Link in the show notes.